It's good to see all the beautiful places, all the beautiful faces here in person. Thank you for those of you who are joining us online. We're so grateful that you could be with us tonight. Um, we are, uh, why don't we start with a prayer before we get into what we're doing tonight. Father, thank you so much uh, for fellowship. Thank you so much for giving us uh, a family while we make our way through a world that is often brutal at times with people that are, are awful to one another, Father. It is good to have so many brothers and sisters to rely upon. God, I pray that you could be with us tonight as, as we try and understand some of the more difficult aspects of your scriptures, uh, especially as it pertains to, to men and women and, and how you made them and, and how you wanted them to function in a world that is so broken. Father, please be with us. Give us wisdom. Give us open hearts and open minds. Father, help us to be humble with one another and humble to your word. We love you so much, God. It's in your son's name that we pray, amen. amen. Well, welcome to tonight's midweek. We are continuing our three-week series of midweeks about gender roles and the Bible. Now, last week, we began, uh, we began the series by hearing from some of the women that have worked in the ministry, who are both young and old, who have worked in the ministry both past and present. And they gave, uh, we had a video where they gave some of their perspectives on what it has been like to, to be in the ministry and what it has been like to be a woman uh, who volunteers and, and, and is in a lot of service for our church. And so we started out with a video like that. And then we continued on to a lesson by Dr. Glenn Giles. And we started out our study of women's roles by looking at a concept called cruciform living. All right? And the reason that we did this is because it's important whenever you study any topic in the Bible, especially one that can be uh, potentially contentious or one that can be highly debated, it's important to start from a position of where Jesus was, someone who is willing to lay down his life for other people, someone who is willing to give up his rights for others, someone who is willing to put the values of others above, above his own. And when you begin a subject where people can disagree so passionately with one another, if you don't begin from a place of where Jesus' heart is, you're bound to have some resentment and some bitterness with those with whom you disagree with. And so we began with this concept of cruciform living. To now tonight, we're going to begin our study of the women's role um, with an interview, okay? And it's an interview between uh, my wife, Megan, and Dr. Glenn Giles. Now, we had asked everybody uh, between last week and this week to go on to our website and view the three videos that Dr. Glenn Giles had uh, put together for the staff. And these were videos that covered some of the more disputable scriptures about the role of women in the Bible. It, it also covered his view of what the Bible means by headship and how that might apply today, as well as some other things. And so we asked everyone to try and view that before they came to midweek tonight. Now, if you haven't been able to do that, that's fine. You'll still be able to get a lot out of this interview, but you'll get even more after you watch the three workshop videos. So you can just go to our website at www.chicago church of Christ. No, Denver Church of Christ. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That's a slip. That's a bad slip right there. <laughs> um, DenverChurchOfChrist.org. And if you go to where it says blog, you'll see a lot of our articles. You'll be able to read the teacher's paper that they put out last year, but then you'll also be able to watch the three videos that Glenn did as a workshop for our staff. Today, we're gonna watch an interview that Megan did with Dr. Glenn Giles. Now, some of the questions our follow-up questions to those, to, those, uh, to those workshop lessons, all right? So she's going to ask some, some follow-up questions to what he taught there. But he's also gonna, she's also going to ask some questions about the process of how the teachers put together the, the paper about the women's role that went around to all of our international churches. She'll ask some questions about the process that we've gone through here in Denver. Now, for those, I'm sure you've, we've, we've said this ad nauseum at this point, but it's been a year and a half of the elders, their wives, uh, the, the evangelists and their wives studying this out, debating it rigorously at times, going back over the same ground over and over again, and trying to come to some sort of consensus on what the Bible is, it, it, what it's saying on some of these issues regarding women today, the church, and their, and their role. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and watch this interview right now between two people who are very passionate and have a lot of strong opinions about this particular subject. So without further ado, the interview. Well, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Megan Zillman, and I'm a woman's minister 
here in the Denver Church, and I'm so excited that we've been spending these last few weeks talking about the women's role. So today, it's my honor and privilege to sit down and ask a few questions of the esteemed Dr. Mr. Dr. Glenn Giles, um, and he is going to help walk us through some of the, some of the uh, arguments, some of the issues, some of the things that get highlighted as we talk about this. So, Dr. Giles, can I call you Glenn? Sure, no problem. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Glenn, <laughs> most people watching are going to know who you are and uh, are, are, you're beloved and well-known here within our fellowship, but can you tell us a little bit about who you are and, and why you in particular are qualified to talk about some of these things in a different way than the rest of us might be? Well, it's interesting. I'm not normally uh, blowing my own whistle, tooting my own horn. <laughs> toot. I'm asking you to. You asked me. Well, toot okay. Toot your whistle. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think one of the things that really is helpful is if you have facilitation with Greek and Hebrew mm -hmm. and also understand how to study the Bible in a deeper way yeah. from a scholarly perspective. Yeah. And so I've, I've done many of those things. I've had probably uh, 25, hour, 25 courses wow. of graduate study and been studying since, I was, and since 1971 when I entered Bible college. Do you know what year I was born? No, I don't know what year. It was after 1971. You were born. Yes, you were born. <laughs> no, I know you were. Give you a hard time. No. no, I didn't know what time, what year you were born. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. No. I was born before that. Yeah, well, good. I hope that's okay with you. <laughs> that's good. It's perfect. A little bit older, getting gray hair and white hair, whatever. It's a But wonder. it was so neat to, that I got, it gave me the opportunity to uh, go through several different schools. One of them was Lincoln Christian University, mm -hmm. where I spent five years to go through uh, a Master of Divinity program. And while I was going through there, master, I, I had to know Greek and Hebrew first before you took the courses. Okay. And so then you took all the courses and you did exegesis on those courses. My major was New Testament. Okay. So after that, I went to uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, where I went five more years for another master's degree. Uh, unbeknownst to me, I, I, I got to study under people that are probably the top-notch scholars in evangelical Christianity today, wow. including Dr. Don Carson, mm -hmm. Dr. Douglas Moo, and Dr. Scott McKnight. Yep. And uh, in fact, Dr. Moon, Dr. McKnight were my readers on my thesis that I did. Wow. It was interesting to really be able to study under them. So I felt very privileged that I had that, that opportunity. Yeah. And then uh, I still wanted to study some more, so I went to a liberal college, a uh, Marquette University is a liberal Jesuit Catholic yeah. university, mm -hmm. and uh, I took a PhD. I did. I finished my PhD residency there in biblical, or actually religious studies, but I focused on New Testament. Um, that was an interesting thing because it was, but it was really good because then I got to see the liberal side of things. Yep. In Lincoln Christian University and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, you had a conservative side. Then you got to see the liberal side. Yeah. And it really stretched my faith a lot, but also yeah. helped me to really dig in and find out well, why wouldn't I want to agree with what they're having to say. Yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, actually at that point, we, my wife and I both became disciples. I was in, in the Christian church before, but I really hadn't been baptized the way I feel God wanted us to be. And so we got baptized. And then I, I stayed in the church and taught for, uh, from 1991. We moved out here in 1991, and I taught until now. Our DCC School of the Bible used to be announced uh, Rocky Mountain School of Ministry and Theology. And so um, in that time, up in 2001, Dr. John Lusk decided, he, he mentioned to me, you ought to finish your PhD. So I, I went back to school and I finished that over a period of about 10 years. So, um, so I've been teaching, uh, not only was I taught for those many years, I also taught Greek at Lincoln Christian University, taught it at Marquette University. Um, and then was in the doctoral program where I got to use it even more. And then now, since 2009, I've been teaching at, at Lincoln Christian University as an adjunct professor in Bible and theology, and, uh, as well as we started our own school. And so I've been teaching graduate courses all along. So 
Hopefully that has some that has some merit to help out in uh, understanding. Yeah, a little, little bit. I mean, I've read a few books about these things, so I think you're probably a little bit more qualified. But this issue in particular with, with women's role, how long have you been studying this out? I had my first class in 1978 uh, at Lincoln Christian University. Okay. Uh, that was an interesting class because I had never really studied it before. Yeah, yeah. But it was a graduate Greek class. Uh, we had to go through about nine, I think it was the same nine, nine uh, passages we went through in, in our gender and Bible study. And uh, it, was, it was neat just to go through and see the issues. Yeah. So. Yeah. And what motivated you to keep studying this out, to keep looking at this? Well, any scholar in their field, once they come up on the issues that are really big issues, mm -hmm. always go back to that periodically because you learn new things, you hear new things, you research new things. Yep. So you come back to really try to, okay, does this make a difference in that? Does this make a difference in this? Do I understand it better? Do I understand it worse? So you always want to try to understand it better. Yeah. And so that's what I've tried to do. And with that question, I did a research on baptism for the dead. I mean, there's nothing out there, right. but you, you still keep that open to be able to study it. Or about Jesus and... Uh, um, and the law, what's yeah. that mean? And so those type of things come back and you revisit them, you revisit them, but you keep an open mind. Yes. So, okay, maybe I can understand this better. Yeah, and has, has this studying and, and these, these, um, these seasons of seeking to understand it better, has it changed your views on this issue uh, at all? I have. I've changed, uh, most of the people in my first class were complementarians, mm -hmm. uh, as was I. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was, I think, one egalitarian, and uh, he, he took, you know, there was a lot of criticism mm -hmm. you know, on his paper and stuff. But um, over the years, I've been, especially the last three or four years, when we studied this out with more contemporary yeah. um, studies from scholars, more, I guess, further studies on scholars, as well as the different lexico lexicographical studies. Um, I've come to be more a soft complementarian than a hard complementarian. Yeah. I'm not egalitarian, yeah. but I've, I've been in the middle in the past and I, I, a little bit, but I think I, I've figured out that's probably where I'm at right now. Yeah, yeah. Mainly because of the studies that I've done on, the, on different words, especially 1 Timothy 2 yeah. and 1 Corinthians 11, and looking at it from a bigger picture of uh, what I call inaugurated eschatology, looking at how the whole men and women uh, relationship is depicted in the entire Bible. Yeah, excellent. Well, and I think most people probably have been able to watch the videos that you that you did for our staff and, and are online there. Um, but let me ask this, you, how long have you been a part of the International Churches of Christ? We became disciples in 1988. Okay. Actually, we were disciples for that. We were baptized disciples. But 1988, yeah. so it's been... What's that? 33 That's years. That's too much math. 33. 33. Okay, sounds good. And so how have you seen, as, our, as, a, as a, our church as a whole, how have, how have you seen the women's rule change over that time? Okay. Uh, yes. It's interesting because we were part of the Christian church. Okay. And there were no women ministers mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, my wife went to one of the Christian church Bible colleges, and she was going to take Greek as one of the required mm -hmm. languages. Well, they said, you're never going to be a minister, and you're never going to teach theology, so you don't need to take so Greek, <laughs> so take German. And so she took German. Yeah. Wow. She didn't take Greek until a few years later, several years later, when I taught her some of it. But, uh, so do you write little Greek love letters to each other sometimes? No, she doesn't understand it as oh, well, okay. but we've done things something like okay. that. <laughs> uh, we actually do more German on that, because I had to take German, okay. too. There you go. Ich liebe dich. Oh, okay. I That's what I tell her. That's good stuff. Um, now, the uh, reason I'm, I want to talk about a little bit, starting with the Christian church, just to give a, uh, a contrast, yeah. because when I went into the ICOC, yeah. things were a lot more rigid, extremely rigid. Uh, and especially the church we went to first was very legalistic about it, too, I, thought, I felt. And... Uh, you didn't see any women on stage. Mm -hmm. No women were leading any singing whatsoever. Yeah. I don't remember any women even speaking on mm -hmm. stage, mm -hmm. or even coming up on the stage, hardly. Yeah. Uh, I don't even, they weren't even helping out with the sound, yeah. things like that. 
Uh, it was all men. They were all dressed in, you know, they had the same type of suits and everything. They were up there. Uh, but what was interesting was, as time progressed, pretty soon you saw women coming up on a stage to uh, be with their husband to say something yeah. or to, or to uh, share something. Uh, pretty soon they got to pray. Uh, pretty soon they got to speak more. Uh, it was incredible. Yeah. They even allowed women to baptize women, mm -hmm. which was not something that yeah, was even was considered. Yeah. Uh, in a Christian church, we, that didn't even come across our minds. You know, the minister will do it. No one even asked a question. Right. Uh, and then, also, they started, um, early on, started appointing women's, uh, women's, what was it called? It was called counselors. women's counselors. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And because that was some type of, might cause a problem with legal issues, they changed to women's ministry leader. Okay. And so... That was something we never had in the Christian church. We never had anything like that. Yeah. Not paid women on staff to be ministers. Mm -hmm. That was that was an incredible yeah. uh, barrier that was broken that, you know, we were just going along and, and watching what was going on, yeah. and, and so it was really good. And all along, as those things happened, I would revisit these different passages. Okay, how does this fit in? Yes. How does this fit in? Does this fit in? Right. What, what, what happens here? Yeah. Um, and so in that process... Uh, we just saw the evolution of women being able to do a lot more things. And so was it, what was different? Was the Bible changing? <laughs> was it just because culture was changing? Why, why do you think it changed? That's an interesting question. Um, I think our doctrine was changing. But the issue we had in that day wasn't that we made the decision on the local level. It was made from a you know, yeah, hierarchy. Sure. Yeah. And so, although I think it was good decisions, uh, we weren't actively involved in that that much. And so I think that's one reason why we have some issues today is sure. we haven't been actively involved and don't know how to deal with that sometimes yes. with making those type of decisions. They weren't just cut and dried, okay, we're going to do this now. Yeah. And so there's been some... Yeah, so things. a decision is made and people might not, wait a second, is this... Yeah. yeah. No, it makes sense. Yeah. Well, and so you we just said, okay, we'll do it that way. They've said to do it. Okay, we're just obeying our leaders. Sure, yep. And so you were recently a part of the ICOC Teachers Committee that did um, an ex ex years of research and then wrote a paper on women's roles right. within, the, within the church. What was that process like? Um, because of the issues that were in the ICOC, we decided we needed to write a paper. Mm -hmm. And I think we were asked by the evangelist team, I think, maybe the elders to do that. And so what we did, we got together and we chose nine passages that we thought were the most important passages to really understand. Yep. And when we did that, we allowed the teacher service team to volunteer as to what parts they wanted to write on okay. and, and collaborate on. Mm -hmm. So this is all a collaboration. Um, and there, some of us were involved in, in all of it, mm -hmm. basically. Steve Kennard was sort of overseeing the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, there were others involved in different papers, yep. and their names not necessarily on there. I was involved in looking at bibliography for all of them mm -hmm. and sharing some of the stuff I'd done in my first class. Uh, in 1978, um, and so we, we, the people in our team uh, chose the passages they wanted to be involved in. They would write and collaborate among their, they'd have a sub-subcommittee, yeah. this is sort of a sub, sub and so they'd collaborate, then it'd come back to the whole group, and we would collaborate on it, and then it'd go back to them again, and then it'd go back and forth mm -hmm. several times, and then that was for about a year and a half, I think. Okay. And then um, some of us, and there were seven of us out of the 11 that were part of it that actually had Greek and Hebrew training. Okay. About five of us, uh, four of us got together in the January 2000 before the publishing of this to really go over everything and fine tooth comb mm -hmm. and try to feel this out. And we did that in New Jersey. And so out of that came uh, a version mm -hmm. And then it went through several other versions before it was finally uh, published in yeah. May, I think it was. Yeah. Last well, year. and so so it was published last year, and we also will have a, a link on our website for people that haven't yet read it to, to be able to access it. But it wasn't um, prescriptive in terms of this no. is what the Bible says, do that, do that. It, it, you guys' role was more this is what we see the, the scriptures saying, right. correct? Right. It's called Bible and Gender. And. Uh, we were just there to try to figure out, okay, what do we think the scripture is saying? Yep. We weren't tasked or even volunteered to do much application at all. Yeah. That was going to be left to the 
churches to figure yeah. out in their own particular area of, of the world how that would work. Yes, no, that so, and that's kind of where we are, right? That's, yes, that's, that's the at. level that we're at now. We're, mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at these things. And um, again, I think, I'm assuming that most people have watched your, your videos. And so some of the, the bigger arguments, they're, they, they're fresh on their minds. But I think sometimes this topic over the years as I've heard it be discussed, it's almost presented as being straightforward. It's pretty cut and dry. On, honestly, on, on, on e extreme opposite sides of the spectrum, um, it's presented as being you know, straightforward. And, um, but I think sometimes people that present it as being straightforward have either read just enough to be dangerous, you know, as they say, or it feels like maybe they have an agenda in wanting things to be a certain way because it doesn't feel straightforward. It feels messy. As a matter of fact, I think the more over the years I have just kind of dived in to try to figure this out, I honestly come up a little bit more uncertain, a little bit less certain about where, you know, before I'm like, yes, this, and then, oh, maybe not, yes, this. And so it, it feels a little bit muddy. So um, I'm hoping that tonight you can even just help us understand. I, I know we're not going to get answers. Like this, you're, you, then is going to solve. This is exactly what this means for all time. This is what we do. But of course, even you got all the answers, although no, no pressure. But if you did that, that honestly, that would make my job a lot easier. But if it happens, it happens. But um, as you're, as we're talking tonight, my hope is even that you help people see that this is muddy, that mm -hmm. this is messy, mm -hmm. that this isn't straightforward, right. right? Otherwise, we probably still wouldn't be debating it right. 2,000 years later. So let me, let me step back a second because I'm making an assumption, but do you agree that this is a messy topic? And if so, how do yeah. you see it being messy? I think it's messy in various ways, um, and it continues to be messy. Uh, one of the ways is it's very difficult to really know for sure what the Scripture is saying. Yeah. That's, that makes it messy. But I think maybe for me, even a more important thing is it's messy emotionally and relationally mm, because yes. it's a hot topic. I feel you. Um, so, I mean, for instance, uh, that first class I took in, at Lincoln Christian University, yeah. we had two professors. And uh, I didn't notice when we took the class that they had difference of opinion that much at that point. But as time went on, uh, I was told that one of them because of this, this disagreement with this, mm -hmm. would no longer talk to the other one. Yeah, I believe it. And, and it just broke my heart because I loved yeah. both of them. They were great professors and scholars. Um, another example of the messiness of it, uh, that it's really difficult passage, is like I said before, I also had classes that was taught by uh, D.A. Carson, mm -hmm. as well as Douglas Moo. They're both complementarians. Yeah. But I was also taught by Scott McKnight. Mm -hmm. And he's now a egalitarian. Yeah. So it's very interesting because I can vouch for these guys that they are some of the top-notch biblical scholars in the world. Yeah. And uh, they can't agree on this. Yeah. And they and I assume that not only are they scholars, but they actually believe. They're not just scholars yes. with them. They, they're, they're believers. They, so they believe yeah, the scriptures. They're conservative evangelical people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what's tricky, right? When you have yeah. people that we're all looking at the scriptures, loving the scriptures, wanting to hold them up as being, um, you know, right. primary. Whew, so what do you do then? Yeah. When we end up, yeah, in a they believe place? in inspiration to scripture that yeah. it's of God, and uh, yeah. Yeah, it's hard. So what? Let, let's take a step back for a second and kind of start out all, with the with the with the big picture, right? And how do you see, even in the scriptures, throughout as you look at the 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 overall narrative in the Bible, how do you see, what's the relationship there with men mm -hmm. and women in, in respect to this issue? This is, I've really gotten excited about this issue this last year. Well, actually, a couple years, but I never really got to work on it until this year. And what I see in the, in the book of Genesis with the creation is men and women were created equal. Yep. And uh, uh, there wasn't, they had different, different things they were to do in, in a way, but they were created equal. There wasn't an idea that one person was better than the right. other. They're both made in God's image. Um, yep. uh, but with the fall, uh, it revealed something that there was, there was friction yep. between them. Right. Uh, uh, maybe a domination characteristic. Uh, even it, it talks about it, in, I think, in uh, Galatians 3, when it talks about when he says to the woman, 
you, your desire shall be for your husband and he will rule over you. It just shows the tension, the idea of desire now. Most scholars are thinking that's more the idea of wanting to dominate. Yeah. And so this domineering thing has caused problems throughout time. I've never experienced that in my marriage. No, but. we never have either. It's just, <laughs> it's, 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 sometimes it's insidious. You don't even recognize it. But uh, So what I see is God created this pair yeah. in this first creation, this first creation that he made, and then men and women made it tarnished because of sin. Sure. And so you got the sin going through ties. But what you see is over time, God promises he's going to bring someone else into the picture to help, help fix this, yep. you know, to help save people. And what's interesting in the New Testament is that person obviously is Jesus. And uh, Jesus talks about a new creation. He talks about that there's going to be a, you are a new creation, but there will be a fulfillment of that new creation. And we see that in Revelation as yeah. we know more crying, more tears. You see in 1 Corinthians 15 how we're going to, have, we're going to be in new beings, yeah. okay, completely, yep. which is awesome. It is awesome. Um, but up until that point, until the resurrection, we have certain roles that I think we play, mm -hmm. not inequality roles, but just things he's given us. Um, that's an important distinction to make. Yeah, I think that's, that's very important. And uh, what I see happening is that uh, it's important, and I was asked this question. Uh, I, I believe that the Bible teaches about headship, and yep. I'll probably talk about that a little bit later. But some people have asked, well, why don't we see that in Genesis 1 and 2? Who don't see that there. Mm -hmm. well, how come it's not there? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting that throughout time, God has what he calls progressive revelation. Mm -hmm. In other words, things are revealed later on in time. So you don't see the idea of headship explicitly until Paul talks about it. Okay. And Paul talks about it and saying, he used the word protos, man was made first. Okay. okay. It had some, what's what? Well, for Paul and I think the whole Bible, there was something to do with who was first. Yeah. Not that they were any better than anybody sure. else, but maybe there's a respect that, that is... Yeah. is, is is assumed should be given there, and maybe there's a, some type of responsibility, you can call it authority if you wish. And so uh, with that, uh, you see that development. It, it, it looks like, it's like, it's like in Genesis 3.15. It talks about the woman, and it talks about uh, the woman's seed's going to crush Satan's head. Yep. Well, it doesn't say that to Jesus. You don't know that right, until much right. later. Yeah. So you got progressive revelations. Just because you don't see something in Genesis 1 and 2 doesn't mean it's necessarily not there. Right. You have to let the rest of Scripture talk to it. So what I yeah. see is that Jesus came to be the new man, the next Adam, the second Adam, like it says in Romans yeah. and, uh, and at 1 Corinthians 15, he becomes the second Adam. And he is going to be now the true head mm -hmm of all mankind, mm -hmm. and mankind, I mean, womankind Humanity. too. We are all gonna be the bride of Christ. Oh, that's a feminine issue. That's feminine <laughs> thought. Right. Uh, we're all, but I, I see that as we approach the, the uh, resurrection, Jesus says there's, there's not gonna, he said at the resurrection, there's not uh, any, ma any uh, marriage or given in marriage. Right. So that type of, that aspect of this world continues on until the resurrection. Mm. But after that, there's a whole different world out there. When right. we became, we are the bride of Christ, he becomes the head of the race, if you will, uh, of the new race. Yeah. He becomes the new, uh, we're, we're the new creation. He's, he's head of everything. So it's going to be different. Yeah. But for me, I see that, that those roles continue on until that resurrection yeah. day. Yeah. And so how does, so, so Paul is taught, he talks about headship there in 1 Corinthians 11. Um, how does that, the idea of headship between men and women, how does that factor in then to our discussion about the roles of women within the church? Okay, let me, let me look at that a little bit. Let's, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 11 and uh, just a bit there. Uh, it's important, I think, to realize, and I say this in my, in my uh, lectures, so I'm not going to go over it really in depth, but it's, Paul says, 
Verse 3, but I want you to realize, it's the word oida, or the word no. Okay. I want you That's to strong. understand. <laughs> Present tense, I believe there. I want you to understand now that the head of every, every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. I think that is uh, incontrovertible. Basically, he's stating this yeah. is the premise I'm we're operating with. Yeah. I want you to know this. Yeah. Uh, because it, then he talks about different things people are doing that shame their head, mm -hmm. depending on what the culture is. He doesn't want us to shame one another. He doesn't want us to shame Christ. Yeah. Um, some people want to translate that as source, mm -hmm. the word kephale, mm -hmm. which means head. But I think that's a, a, a kind of a, not really a good foundation. Yeah. And, um, and I, I think I say that in my lectures. So even if you do have the word source, it doesn't mean there isn't any authority to it. But yeah. when you look at the idea of, of authority, and you look at the lexicons on the word kephale, there's a strong uh, emphasis on or evidence of some type of authority. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that Jesus turned that upside down, mm -hmm. the idea of authority. And I think I may mention that too. But he said in, in Matthew 20, he says, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must, uh, must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Mm -hmm. So Jesus flip-flopped that. Yeah. In that day, it, this, that would have been heresy in, in wow. the Greco-Roman mind. No, woman, you've you got to obey me. Right, you know, right. It's, it's that yeah. type of thing. Yeah. And, uh, but he's saying... Uh, or whoever, if you, uh, man, you got to, you know, whatever the case is, it was, it was more of an, uh, I might call it today, abusive type relationship. Sure. But I want to look at something because I think it helps over in Ephesians 5, just okay. briefly. I think Ephesians 5 helps us to understand what this headship is like. Yeah. It's not the type of headship where I'm boss. Mm -hmm. It's a headship where it's a mutual, I may be finally responsible. Yeah. But it doesn't mean I'm the boss, I'm gonna make I'm gonna bulldoze you and make you do what you want or make whoever do what you want. Yeah. In Ephesians 5, it talks about the headship with husband and wife. And it says, submit in verse 20, 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So there's a submission on both sides. Absolutely. There's the idea of women, uh, wives submitting to their husbands, but there's also the idea that men should love their wives. That wouldn't that wouldn't fly in a Greco-Roman day. So Jesus is turning this upside down, and Paul's following suit here, showing this is how headship should work. Yeah. And so I think it's so important, and part of it is that he says, love your wives, but the wives should respect their husband. Yeah. So you've got that balance. Absolutely. But it's not an authoritarianism. And so I think it's important to take the other, other views or other usages of the word headship and look at uh, 1 Corinthians 11 through those eyes, as yeah. well as Jesus' uh, changing of what authority is like. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it makes me think maybe some of the, um, the tension that's around the idea and notion of headship isn't based on biblical headship. It's based on our own messed up yeah. ways of looking at headship and authority and what these things have perhaps meant yeah. since the fall. And so. I think I myself as a man have a long ways to go. Mm -hmm. I look at how I mean to be, need to treat my wife better. In the past, I haven't treated her like I should. Or even people in a church. If we've got headship in the church, yeah. if it's the elders, how have we treated people? Yeah. You know, I think we're all got a long way. So that doesn't mean you, you, you throw out right. the truth, yes. but that you try to uh, conform your life to it. Yeah, no, that's really good. That's helpful. I think, um, so not only does that passage give people pause and I think create some, some angst in, in hearts, um, but another passage that, that certainly does that is in 1 Corinthians 14. Um, and it's funny because our church, well, let me read 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home, for it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Okay, so that's a, that, that, a I read that, and it's a bitter pill to, to, it can be a bitter pill to swallow, right? But yeah. even that, here we are at church... And I'm not, I'm talking right now. Right. So are we, am I sinning against this scripture by sitting here 
doing this um, this interview with you. I mean, can you can you maybe help us understand, <laughs> as a scholar, what is what is the silence talking about here? What does this passage mean? Well, it's important. That's a good question. It's important to understand context. Yeah. And here, that word is sagao. Uh, but it's used several times in this context from verse 26 following in chapter 14. And if you look at real close there, it says in verse 28, if there is no interpreter, then the speaker should keep quiet. That's mm. the word sagao in the church. And to speak to himself and to God. This is talking about speaking in tongues. Now, this could be men or women, mm -hmm. uh, but especially men. So he's telling men to be quiet. Yeah. Okay, the same word. And then at verse 29, two or three prophets should speak, and the others should, should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who's sitting down, the first speaker should stop. Okay. It's the word sagao. It's like a pause. Yeah, just stop, you know. Don't, don't speak if the first one, you know, let, the first speaker should stop. Let another speak. For you can all, all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. And he goes on and he says, then he uses in verse 34, women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. We don't know what law that was. Was it the Old mm -hmm. Testament law? Was it Roman law? We're not sure. But it says women should remain silent in the churches. And then he goes on and he says, let the women talk to their own husbands at home if, if they want to find out something for it is disgraceful. I take the word disgraceful as more of a, uh, a cultural thing mm -hmm. because not everything in one culture is disgraceful in another culture. Sure. And as such, looking at the context here, uh, the word silent has to do with order silence, silence to cause order to happen. Okay. Because it's talking to men and women, different things are doing. Uh, women, there may be a cultural aspect here about going home and talking to their husband that may not apply to men, uh, which I don't think would. But I think the, the big issue is here that, they, that women need to be silent in order to promote the order of the service. Now, it can't mean all silent because in 1 Corinthians 11 yeah, it talks you about... see women praying and Praying and prophesying. prophesying. So it yeah. can't mean that. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I see that as mostly cultural uh, to try to try to promote the order that Paul talks about, not only here, but in a lot of, the, uh, a lot of this uh, book in 1 Corinthians. Yeah. So you have, you, have that, you have a passage like that. Again, when you, when you have a straightforward reading, if, you, if that's all you have, okay, silence. Right. And then the, the, the other scripture that gets used, um, it, again, that causes some, some, some angst here and um, is in 1 Timothy 2, which says something similar, starting in 11, a woman should learn, I appreciate it says that though, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. So again, as I read this, as just an English reader, I don't speak Greek. Um, let's say I'm just approaching the scriptures for the first time. That seems to be pretty straightforward. Right. Like, okay, shh, right? There's right. no... Can you walk us in this one too again, just through the Greek and and maybe explain a little bit what the larger context of what would have been going on there in Ephesus? What might have, what might have prompted it that that makes this maybe not quite as straightforward as as we've read it before? Okay. Yes, the main issue is verse twelve. I do not permit, and this is Paul speaking. What he does, it's not necessarily a command here. I don't believe. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over man. The issue here has to do with basically a Greek construction mm -hmm. and the definition of authority here. Okay. Um, it's, it, the Greek construction is, is uh, de ou de, which is the idea we translate neither nor. So a better translation might be, uh, neither do I, per, I do not, Neither do I permit a woman to teach nor to exercise or assume authority over man. So it's a, this, this Greek construction brings two, different, two similar ideas together, not completely, but they have a common, uh, something common among them. Mm -hmm. And so what happens here is scholars will either not notice that, okay. and they'll say, okay, I won't let a woman teach mm -hmm. a man, or 
have any authority over a man. Okay. They would separate those two and say, well, you can't teach any man. That means what it seems to me like what Priscilla did with Apollos would be right. sin. Right. Uh, or exercise authority or have some type of authority. Uh, another way people look at that is to see usually the de uda connections of, of teach and, and authority uh, can be looked at either positively or negatively. And okay. so the people who want to see it as positively see a positive authority that God wants, wants uh, men to have and also a teaching authority that evidently men should have. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, uh, teaching false doctrine and the right authority or the wrong authority and the right doctrine. It would okay. be the other way. So they would see that this is talking about uh, authoritative teaching. Okay. And any other type of authority is mm -hmm. what's prohibited there. And so uh, then there's a third way to look at it, and that is that the idea of authority, the word authentain here, which is for authority, uh, can be positive or it can be negative. Yeah. Uh, the dictionaries are showing that now, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's coming to the forefront more and more, I think, the, that, that it can mean either way. And so for those, and I'm included here, who take it as a negative perspective, then you also see teaching as some type of a negative. negative. I see it more as a domineering type thing okay. that they're doing. Or you could do like uh, one of the lexicons says, it's independent authority. Okay. In other words, you're assuming something that's not yours. Mm -hmm. And so there's different ways to see that and understand that. We don't really have in, in English a, a good... Uh, the neither nor is, is probably good, but it's, it's hard to, to understand yeah. it just by reading it in English. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that even, I mean, my mind is, I'm like going back to diagramming sentences Sorry in English class, and I can't <laughs> even do it in English. So, um, but even, even that, you, you bring up an issue of, um, I think, authority. What does it mean to have authority? Right. Like, even that's right. a bit subjective. And again, I'm not trying to say, so let's land on what do we think that says, but it's just, it's so muddy. It's so... Yeah. There's room for people to look at the same thing and come out right. Different, and they're right. And they're on both sides of the issue. Yes. If you look at most yes. of the translations, they'll translate as "have authority," mm -hmm. which is a positive thing. Right. So they would be with the second right. ones I, I talked about. Then you have the King James version. It says "usurp authority," yep. which would be on more on the uh, yeah. egalitarian perspective. Very different. But what's interesting, I think there's movement toward a more neutral position, which yeah. it could be either. And that comes from, when you, when you look at the pre-2011 uh, NIV translation, mm -hmm. uh, it, it translates this, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority. Okay. But that's not what this one says now. Right. Right. This is a 2011. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority. Yep. Yeah, there's now, a difference there, for sure. The idea of assume for a lot of people can be negative, yeah. but it can be positive. Right. So what's interesting is I've got a quote here from my former professor, Dr. Mu, when they asked him about this, because they thought, well, assume sounds negative. Right. And they knew he wasn't negative. Yeah. And uh, he was evidently on the, on the translation, helping out with the translation of this NIV in 2011. He said the translators believe that assume authority could be taken in either direction. We often use this phrase in a neutral way, such as, when, when will the new president assume authority? But assume can be in a bad way, too. It is our intent to provide a translation that is faithful to the text, bowing to no particular theological agenda. Mm. Now, this is really telling to me. Yeah. Because if have authority is changed to assume authority because it has some type of doctrine, yeah. that's interesting because what is happening is opening up the door to validate that there's two ways to look at this. Yeah, yeah. And this comes from Dr. Mu, who, yeah. he's, he's a complementarian, he's not an egalitarian. Right, right, yeah. So I just think, I, so I, see, I see doors beginning to open yeah. to see this in a little bit, maybe more balanced way. Yeah, no, well, I, I love it, and I love your, your perspective and your excitement on these things. Um, let me, like, we'll have to start to wrap up here, so, We've just looked at a few of the passages that, again, cause confusion, that make the, mud, the, the, the waters feel a little bit muddy, that, that make us say, well, where do we go from here? And so um, 
my question to you is, is that? Like, where do we, the Denver Church of Christ, given all of this, given further study, given uh, our commitment to keeping God's scriptures as primary in our lives, where, where do we go from this? Well, how do we make decisions mm -hmm. on this topic and, and what this looks like practically within our, our fellowship? Uh, the practical side, I think I want to, for us to continue to work on. Yeah. I think if you accept headship, it depends on how headship is going to be understood. Yeah. Because you could take a variety of ways that headship can be understood. I think this is the most important of all this, is that we must approach this and one another and God from a cruciform lifestyle, yes. where we're denying ourselves for the better of the other person, yes. which I talked about last week. Absolutely. So that's so important. I think those are the ways to start moving forward. You've got to be able to make some decisions on these things before you try to practically apply them. Yeah, that's good. It's, it's, it's wisdom, I think, because it's easy. F in my nature, it's easy, like, okay, so what does this mean? What are we going to do? Right. And then you shortcut. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a lot that has to happen before we get to the what are you going to do, right? Right. right? Especially if we're, if we're going to try to keep in step with one another and, and build trust with right. one another. Exactly. Um, so the, for the last year, right, the year and a half maybe, the, the, the leadership group of the, the Denver Church of Christ here, we've been wrestling through these things. We've been talking about these things. We've read books together. You've taught us um, on, on many different levels. Um, we've had some lively discussions. We've had some boring discussions. <laughs> like there's, yeah, the, sure. there's the whole, the whole strain. It's been a very, I think, intentionally, I will say that intentionally lengthy and intentionally laborious process for those very reasons that you mm -hmm. just described, right? So for you as an elder and a, a teacher within this congregation, um, what's been challenging about this process for you, and, and what's, conversely, what's been, what's been heartening for you through yeah. this process? I think maybe the most, well, not, not the most challenging, one of the challenges is that anytime there's change, potentially change, is that we, we tend to hang on to our traditions, yeah. what we've been taught in the past. And it's not necessarily bad. Traditions aren't all bad. But to be able to Bring those back up for examination mm -hmm. is sometimes very threatening, yeah. and it's really difficult. Uh, and I think that's been one of the one of the issues. It's been it's been a, sort of a painful thing to yeah. do. Yeah. Um, and secondly, we're all on a different journey. I've been on this journey for forty three years. Right. Have you been on a journey for forty three years? I'm forty four. I've been on ah, a journey about. for okay. forty four years. Close. <laughs> so. Um, I think we got to be able to understand where people are on are at on this yeah. journey and give some grace there and yeah. be able to have this cruciform living to you know it's like uh, if if I expected my children I'm not saying everybody that's on a different different uh, time or children but just for example the children I can't expect them to be a certain place if they don't have the experience and they haven't really yeah. dug into something right. and not to say that I have everything right either I don't but I think that's one of the one of the couple of the big things that we have to watch out for. Yeah. And I think one of the opportunities, though, is to see that we have an opportunity to live a cruciform li yes, lifestyle. Yes, we do. Learning how to have patience, learning how, yes. to, how to bear with one another, yep. learning how to maybe accept things on, on, on something that, if it's decided, that I don't think is really a salvation issue. It's yep. in a salvation passage in First Timothy 2, I believe, but I don't think that that part of it is a salvation issue. I think it has to do with something else. We can talk about it another time. But if it's not a salvation issue, then we need to really examine where we're at uh, and examine the emotions and be able to use them to the glory of God, yeah. not, not just how I want to. Yeah, absolutely. That's been one of the things that I've learned so much through this process because if someone disagrees with me vehemently, Automatically, what do I do? I, guard, I, put, yeah, I put up my guards exactly. and I make assumptions. And, I, and so through this process, God has done much to just stop, yeah. put down those guards, put yeah. down those guards and meet one. Because I want people to meet me where I am. Yeah. So how dare I not be willing yeah. to do, again, to practice the cruciform living. Yeah. Um, do you think that all of the leadership of the Denver Church of Christ sees things and interprets these passages in the same way that you do? No. Linda and I interviewed everybody. <laughs> um, and there's people on both extremes. There's yeah. people in the middle. Um, and is that, so. is that problematic? I don't think. I think it's good to reveal that. We're yeah. becoming more open, yes. find out where we're at, yeah. 
Can you reveal yourself as something that's so sensitive? And if you can, that shows growth, I think. Yeah. To be able to talk about it and to try to figure it out among yourselves. So, yeah, I don't think it's a problem if we embrace cruciform living. Yeah. yeah. I think if we don't... Then it, then it becomes a problem. You have splits, like right. a couple of professors who didn't talk to each other anymore. Absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's sad. It's so true. Yeah. In all, in all areas, in all issues, right? Yeah. Um, so last, last question, and this is just completely, I mean, this is very subjective. So I'm asking you, what do you think God is doing? Okay, so keep that in mind. I, I get that that's a thing. But this topic, and there's others throughout the scriptures, but to me, it just feels ambiguous. It feels like it was left ambiguous that God could have, he could have made it a lot clearer. He could have made it a lot more straightforward to my way of thinking. Why do you think God... Why, why isn't it as straightforward? Why does he allow this? He wanted to torture you. No. <laughs> That's, sometimes I feel like that, to be honest. Uh, no, I, and torture me, you know, sometimes. No, I think, I think the issue isn't the ambiguity of us today. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it was ambiguous to those people in that day. Good point. The problem we have is that we're 2,000 years removed from the New Testament, and even further from the Old Testament. Right. And so there's new culture. There's new understanding. There's understandings that have not, that you can't dig up. Yeah. Okay, what's it mean, like baptism for the dead? What's that mean? I don't know. Yeah. I couldn't find anything. Yeah. Uh, and so there are things that were, there are gaps in yes. our understanding. And so that's why it's so important for us to really dig in. That's why we created our Rocky Mountain School of Ministry and Theology, yeah. so we can help people dig into those. That's great. To make a better decision on those things, yeah. so things that, look straightforward, and most of the Bible is straightforward. I don't want to give right. an idea that it's not. There are certain things that it is pretty difficult, and, and, and it helps you to be able to understand more deeply what those issues are yeah. so you can make those decisions. Yeah, no, that's good, because the gaps, I think, do force us to dig yeah. in more with God, and then also they give us the opportunity, like you said, to practice the, mm -hmm. the cruciform living, right? And I think the gaps are in our everyday life. Yeah. For instance, if you have a disagreement with someone, Lots of times it's probably just because you don't understand where they're coming from. So true. There's a gap. And yes. that's in today's present world. Right. What do you think for right. 2,000 years? Yeah. No, that's perfect. That's excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, helping us dissect this a little bit, for, for uh, bringing up issues that maybe we have or haven't thought about, and uh, especially just for I very much appreciate your heart and your humility. I, I love that through all of this you clearly are a man that loves God, that honors God, that cares deeply about his word. And so you've, you're willing to do the deep dives that some of us aren't, aren't able to do and then come back up with, with what you find. But I appreciate that your, um, your heart is one of, 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 a, of a humble curiosity that you allow all of us to benefit from. So thank you so much for, for this time. Thank you all for, for listening. Again, if you didn't get a chance to hear the, the previous um, last week's lesson about cruciform living or the previous lessons that he, um, where he did more in-depth teaching about all these passages, go ahead and look on our website and you'll find it there. But thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. And thank you. All right. Thanks for joining us uh, both in person and online. You know, I was thinking, is it easier to raise like six and seven year olds, or is it easier to raise teenagers? It's a lot easier, in my opinion, to raise six and seven year olds because the, the response can be, you do this because I told you so. And they go, okay, right? As teenagers, it's why. It's uh, just because you said it, I'm gonna go and do the opposite. And I, you know, and I think it was easier when our kids were little to say, well, here's the answer. And just very confidently, even though I was making it all up, but as we mature, we get called on some of that stuff. And so I know for some, as you're hearing these things, you may go, uh, wait a minute, like I, I, I knew for sure, 100% what that scripture meant. And Glenn and Megan and you guys are messing with my brain. And I think that's okay, right? Because as we mature, as we become more fully like Christ, we're going to understand things more. For you, those, those of you who have become Christians in, you know, more than like 10 minutes ago, do you know more about Jesus now than you did when you were baptized? Yeah, we all do, right? 
And I think as we grow more and more, we're going to figure these things out. We're going to grow and grow to be more and more like Christ. And I think that's a good thing. So uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, click the QR code or uh, scan that and uh, send those in. Uh, if you have comments about like the wording of a Google form that I can't change. You can keep those to yourself. But uh, I don't know who you are, but that was for you. Uh, but we're going to end with a prayer. I got the mic. I get to do what I want. Uh, we're going to end with a prayer here and then a couple of quick announcements. Okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time together tonight. So grateful that you are a God of great patience and that you love us and have given us your word to decipher through it together. I really am grateful for the elders and their wives and for the staff. Just the hours that we've been able to pour into this together and really the conversations we've been able to have and with with the membership at large, Father, I'm thankful for these times, Lord, that we can really explore and uh, I'm so thankful to have been able to serve you full-time as a women's ministry leader for almost 22 years. That's just crazy. And uh, I really am grateful for the ways that I've been able to teach the women, to be able to study the Bible with the women, to be able to just counsel couples. Um, it is such a privilege to be able to serve you, Father. And I do pray for wisdom moving forward, what our roles should look like, what as women we should um, embrace and the ways that we can really grow and change and um, just be who you created each one of us to be, Father. I really am grateful for each and every person here and their hearts to love you and to really make you Lord of their lives, Father. I do pray that you would help us to apply the things that Glenn taught last week about cruciform living and uh, just having a heart to put others' needs first and to really think about other people before we respond, Lord. But I love you and thank you.